Hello and welcome to the Cinementalist podcast for Cinementalist.com. My name's Andy, sitting next to me is Floki, our bearded dragon mascot, and sitting opposite me is Liam. How's it going, dude? Really great. Uh, hey, plenty of energy this week. No, I was joking. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm all right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, same as you. Sound, do. yeah. <laughs> Decent. It's, uh, for some reason, I don't believe you. Huh? You know, should we send international rescue? Uh, nah, can't be bothered. <laughs> so. You'd be the kind of guy to turn him away. Thunder yeah, I would. One and two turns up. Nah, yeah, so no, I I'm just right. can't. Oh, well, stop providing me with these interactions I didn't fucking ask for. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know. You know what it's like. You're having a bad day already, and then the fucking Thunderbirds turn up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is full on October now. Yeah. I'm kind of feeling those bonfire night vibes. I know we, um, we sort of jumped the gun a little bit last week with some impromptu Christmas chat. It feels more bonfire at the moment for me. Do you often do you do firework displays and things? I don't think we've ever been to one together. No, nah, not for many years now. I remember like a, a couple of times as a kid, I'd go to sort of certain big ones near us. And uh, there was a couple of times we were, I remember a few times my dad actually put on a firework display in the back garden with loads oh, of Oh, that's people always over. good. A pissed up dad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that was quite fun. But High no, explosives. Not in uh, many years. And all, and also, uh, and, you know, thank God we're anonymous with this admission. Um, me and some friends also used to break into the local reservoir and watch the great big show that usually charges eight pounds a ticket for free. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> everyone around here does that. Yeah, there's a yes. huge display in a, uh, a town down the road. And everyone just goes, it's such a huge display. Everyone just goes to the park and watches it instead. Yeah. Because why would you pay? Yeah, you, like, you get you it's get like twenty quid a ticket to you, get in as you, well, and you get the best view by sitting on the hill of yeah. the reservoir. And you know, I know that there's at least one person out there going out saying, "I came here to listen to films, not about missions of wanton criminality." But you know, well, on this podcast, you get both. Yeah, so, absolutely, you know, mate. Yeah. Value for money. We're dark horses, no. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. But yes, you are listening to a film podcast, and uh, as usual, I have some film news to start. Would you like some? Is it going to be exciting? Oh, it's, no, that's a no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, oh, it's okay. There's, there's some stuff to discuss anyway. Uh, let's start out with a new release. Uh, Jay-Z Western, The Harder They Fall, fires up London Film Festival. Uh, did you know Jay-Z was doing a Western? No, I know like, The Harder They Fall. That was like a movie in the early 70s with uh, Jimmy Cliff or something. Oh, really? I never saw that. And it was previously also in 1956. It was a uh, boxing noir. I think with Bogart and Rod Steiger. Well, this is apparently a Western. Uh, I'm getting this from, for some reason, France24.com. <laughs> I don't know why. Because I'm reasons, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for, for a film festival with a, you know, an American producer in London. But there you go. Um, with Idris Elba leading an impressive all-black cast and Jay-Z among the producers, the premiere of Netflix's reimagined Western, The Heart of the Fool, opens the London Film Festival with a bang on Wednesday. You say the harder the fool. The harder the fool. Oh, the harder yes. the fool. Yes. Oh, okay. So my that ref- hasn't been reused. My references to the other two films were completely fucking meaningless. Did I say they the first time around? I believe so. Yeah. Oh shit! Well, it's the harder the fool. Unless anyway. I'm just you know demented. <laughs> you know, could be. The movie, a directorial debut for Londoner James Samuel, showcases an array of black talent portraying real life historical characters from the old west in a fictional plot. Samuel, who co-produced and co-wrote the original screenplay, left longtime friend Elba little choice but to play Rufus Buck, a violent and feared outlaw of the era. It was, you're doing it. We grew up together doing stupid shit, and here we are making a western, Elba joked, as the pair discussed the film in a news conference with other cast and crew. Samuel, also a singer-songwriter and music producer who worked with Jay-Z on tracks for The Great Gatsby in 2013, said collaborating again with the rap star reaffirmed that his talents go well beyond music. The interesting thing is he's super cine literate, the 42-year-old filmmaker said. People think of the name Jay-Z and they automatically assume music, he added, noting that he was vastly knowledgeable about both Westerns and film in general. Mm. So there you go, Jay-Z, a bit of a uh, Western film fan, apparently. It does sound intriguing for sure. Hmm. I kind of, every time I see Jay-Z in the news, and it's not very often these days, he's one of those people that I kind of think like, good for you. Because he had this massive music career where he you know, became massively influential, made a huge amount of money. And then he married one of the most beautiful women in the world and they had a kid together. And then he sort of went, fuck it. And every time I see him in the papers now, he's, <laughs> he's just spending his money. And I kind of think, you know what, man? Fair enough. Yeah, I've never had anything against Jay-Z. He's always seemed like a pretty solid fella to me. Yeah. yeah so. But it'll be interesting to see what he can add to the... Uh, it seems like he's actually, I mean, although he's credited as a producer, and I imagine they're leaning on him quite hard in terms of promoting the thing because he's such a huge name. But it does seem from the sound of that like he had quite a heavy hand in the uh, in the actual making of rather than, you know, often when you get like a producer credit, 
that can mean anything. That can mean you turn up to the set occasionally and watched, you know. Well, producers vary in terms of their influence on the. I am always film. intrigued when there is, uh, you know, prolific musician uh, getting involved in the motion picture side of things because it's happened many times before in varying deg- varying ways. Uh, to you know, a lot of success over here and sometimes not so good over there. You know, like some people really, really suck. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Who knows? Maybe, maybe he'll be adept at it. Maybe he, you know, he'll roll out something that's really, really good. Mm. And um, he could, yeah, move on. To I'd like that. to see a return to form for Idris Elba as well. He went from being an actor that everyone was really hyped about to taking some really, really dodgy roles for some reason. I'd like to see him really, you know, get his. Well, you refer you refer to the Dark Tower. Yeah, and there were a couple of other things he turned up in where I'm like, oh, Idris Elba's in this, and then yeah. he, he was sort of in it to be Idris Elba for a bit. And well, he was in like Hobbs and Shaw. Yes, and yeah, 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 and a, f- a few other sort of speaking mentioning walk on parts. Like, I you was know? actually chatting to somebody at work the other day about um, the uh, the Luther movie that's apparently stewing in the pot. Yes, yep. And uh, yeah, you know that will be something I'd be mega excited about if they, you know, the ball really, really gets rolling on that one, and we get announcements about it. I'd love to see a Luther film. Because- I can definitely see that working as well because uh, I believe it's, um, I think season two and season three of Luther are, it's all like one continuing plot line where it's not just murderer of the week. They do like yeah. a bigger narrative. So well, can, they've already got form for, for doing see, that. See, I completely get why Idris is cast in action roles because he's got the physique, he's got the demeanor. But um, the best things he's done is where it's, it's driven by his force of character, like yeah. Luther, like the He's wire. a character actor, yeah. yeah. He's, he's not just a you know, Lu- yeah, bodybuilding yeah. hunk. Yeah. Luther, Stringer Bell, you know, he's like, he's actually, he's a phenomenal actor, really. So, but yeah, it'd be nice to see him come away from all this action-oriented stuff and go back to what I think is his main strength, his predominant strength, you know, as he's not really action hero, is he? That's more Schwarzenegger, because no one can accuse Arnie of being a decent actor. Yeah. No, sorry. <laughs> So just to cover for my own mistake here, it wasn't a mistake. In the title of this article, the film is billed as The Harder They Fall. And then in the first opening paragraph, it's The Harder The Fall. So the article is wrong. It's one of those two. The article is wrong. Yeah, well, that's why I don't get stuff normally from France 24. But there you go. It just happened to, <laughs> happened to be the article this week. Well, we won't be eye. using them again. <laughs> Letter of complaint. <laughs> Murd. <laughs> uh, this is from NBCNews.com. Russian film crew blasts off to make first movie in space. Now, we covered this before. Yes. The, uh, first movie shot in space. Space. The final frontier. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're up there at the moment, shooting, filming, um, probably spinning around, realizing this was a terrible idea. Do you reckon they're going to have thought. that Tim Curry insert in there? Yeah, space. <laughs> space. <Yeah. laughs> I've, I've, got, I've gone the only place where capitalism can't touch me yeah. or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, but uh, yeah, actor Yulia Perisild and director Klim Shipenko blasted off Tuesday for the International Space Station in a Russian Soyuz spacecraft. Uh, the Soyuz MS-19 lifted off as scheduled from the Russian Space Launch Facility in Bakunur, Kazakhstan. Space officials reported the crew were feeling fine and all spacecraft systems were functioning normally. Now, none of that surprises me because the uh, Russian transport system to the ISS has been fairly reliable for quite a long time now. I've got a funny feeling they're going to be spinning around feeling sick, thinking that this was a really bad idea. <laughs> and then you could have done this a lot easier on a soundstage like, you know, every other space film ever. But like someone's normal, going to like be normal first. people. Yeah. yeah. And the film is going to be called The Challenge. I guess that's sort of self-referential. In, in Very way. clever. Yeah. Very clever indeed. Uh, Shipenko 38, who has made, I love the way the article puts this, several commercially successful movies. Uh, okay. Also described... Uh, you see a curious absence of any title. Yes, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I thought <laughs> as well. Uh, also described their fast track four-month preparation for the flight as tough. Of course, we couldn't make many things at the first try and sometimes even at a third attempt, but it's normal, he said. Shipenko, who will complete the shooting on Earth after filming space episodes, said that Shkaparov and two other Russian cosmonauts on board the station will all play parts in the new movie. So not only are we going to get a movie shot in space, we're going to get astronauts um, are supposedly acting in it. I don't think they pick astronauts for their acting ability. I'm pretty sure that's pretty low down on the, on the list of priorities. I'm not in, entirely sure we're going to get... We're so down on this film, I know. But it is faintly ridiculous. It is purely there to be... Yeah, you know, to plant the flag, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The main thing is beating Tom Cruise. And yeah, I'm totally for that, by the way. Anybody that wants to take some of the shine off of Tom Cruise, I think that's quite funny. But at the same time, well, this is going to be... 
there's going to be something. It's going to be something. I mean, but it's not, you know, a brand new 21st century space race, but uh, not this time driven by, you know, essentially being the um, the flagship civilization that did it. It's, yep. all, it's all like, <laughs> let's beat fucking, talk, let's beat the, one of the apex Hollywood superstars doing it yep. by making a shitty film in the process. Let's <laughs> make Tom Cruise spit out his <clears throat> toast over the morning newspapers, I think is the idea. Behind How this far one. these objective standards have fallen. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ. As you said, I it mean, used to be about human <clears throat> endeavor, right? Now it's at least, about- <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, we want yeah, okay. It's like, yeah, we want to fuck the Americans, but we also want to be the first people in outer space. I mean, that you could look at that and go, well, I mean, that's commendable enough motivation, if any. Not this. <laughs> <laughs> not like this. Not like this. Another article from NBC News here. Actually, they seem to actually be doing some fairly good articles on media these days, although, yeah, a dubious organization. But anyway, um, translators, experts weigh in on Squid Game subtitle debate. Did you see anything about this? No. A lot of um, Korean speakers have criticized the English subtitles for Squid Game for being um, not entirely accurate and for changing the meaning. In particular, uh, there's a character called Han min and apparently her dialogue, according to these um, Korean commentators, is botched and sterilized. When the actor tries to convince other players to play a game with her, the caption states, I'm not a genius, but I've still got it worked out. Amaya said what she actually said was, I am very smart, I just never got a chance to study. So a bit of a leap in the translation there. I thought this was an interesting thing to talk about, actually, because we're always banging on about um, never doing the dubbing. Like, if you have the option between dubbing and subtitles, always, always go for the subtitles because it's so much better to hear the enunciation. And even if you don't understand the language, you know, getting that feeling from the actor. Dubbing is always throws off I the, despise the dubbing. Yeah. Dubbing just, nine of that ten ruins. So as soon as um, I hear the first dubbed syllable come up and someone's like, right, fuck off. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, 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 don't, I can't get into it. But the thing with subtitles is it's far more of an art than a science, I think. Yes, Because yeah. things don't literally translate. I mean, I watch a lot of foreign language productions with subtitles. And yeah, I'm not multilingual, but I do know bits and pieces. And there are some parts that are very obviously not literal translation. They've just, occasionally you see like an English phrase turn up, like I'll just pop to the shops or something like that. And you're like, yeah, I'm not sure these French people phrased it like that. <laughs> you know, but, it's, but they're using the equivalent of, because if you do the literal translation, it wouldn't mean anything to an English speaking audience. But there is obviously a lot of leeway they, there to get it wrong, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I suppose, yeah. On the one hand, I suppose you can only really do your best because I, as you know, I mean, I am also a big fan of many foreign language films. And when I've spoken to certain native speakers of a particular language and have discussed this very topic with them and go like, so, you know, in this particular instance, this character says this, is this, that, that is this direct translation. Mm. And more often than not, the other person will say, yeah, kind sort of. Sort of, yeah. Yeah, like... They in, have to sort in of go appro- down the middle with it, don't yeah, they? Yeah, it's like in an approximate way, but there's also a lot of connotation there that is being missed out, that is not being uh, um, conveyed at all. So yeah. It's like, but I suppose, you know, as long as you are doing your best, you can only really do it as much, because as you said, there are a lot of things that don't translate. It seems like quite a heavy responsibility on the uh, translator's backs as well, because you're really... You're interpreting someone else's art form, really, and trying to do your damnedest to get across what you think the director and the producers were trying to convey with the piece. A lot of the problem with um, Squid Game, I think, is because it's uh, you know it's, it's got a lot of subtext involving um, uh, differences in strata and classes in Korean society. So the difference between I'm not a genius, but I've still got it worked out, and I am very smart, I just never got a chance to study, is quite a big leap, isn't it? Because <clears> with the second line, the intended line, is she's essentially saying that um, because of her class background, she wasn't able to, yeah, you know, she wasn't able to use her intelligence in the way she would like. Yeah, that's, that's an important part of the subtext that the show is trying to convey that got lost in translation. Even worse than that, I've seen a few people reporting that they've noticed that the subtitles are different depending on literally on what um, computer you're watching it on. There are a couple of people saying they were watching it like with their flatmate in the room and they were both watching it on laptops with headphones on and their subtitles were different. And they were both watching you know, the same stream at the same time. 
So God knows what's going on there. Whether what there's, the fuck? Yeah, well, there's different versions of the subtitles going round or, yeah. But apparently a lot of Korean speakers are quite annoyed because this show has gone absolutely massive as I predicted it would. And it's becoming very possibly Netflix's biggest hit. I mean, that's how big the viewing numbers are and the, the cultural impact it's having. I think that's all well and good. I loved Squid Game for many reasons. And please go back to my review if you'd like to hear them. But um, yeah, the Koreans, I think, are a little bit annoyed about this the more the story is spreading in that this is a huge international advert for, for, you know, for better or for worse. You know, Korean people, Korean culture, Korean actors, their you know, class system and the, the way they live. And it's dealing with all those segments of Korean society. To get the translation wrong is it's potentially culturally offensive, isn't it? Or you know, culturally disastrous in terms of um, getting that out to the rest of the world. Brits and Americans wouldn't appreciate it if... Uh... Does make you wonder about the other way around, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, if there, if there was, uh, say, like a big, big, yeah, any big American or British export, and also take that further and say it was one that focused on a particular pocket, say it was a film depicting working class British or American people and it was uh, rather slang heavy and... God knows how they translate things like snatch and lock well, yeah. stock. And you were, but you were to find out that, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, with comedies, you could argue it might be, uh, you know, less. I mean, the very thing about comedies is not to be taken, they're not to be taken seriously, but let's say it was something to be taken seriously and something that was essentially woven into the fabric of a certain strata of people was butchered in translation around the world. I do think a lot of people would have their backs up going, yeah, but that's not what that fucking means though. Mm. You know, so yeah, I can empathize with people being ticked off about it. Yeah. I, Netflix has been very, very quiet about this as well. I don't know. This suggests, I think, that things are going on behind the scenes. We fucked going, up. We don't want to admit we fucked up. Well, yeah, going, going, what do we do about this? I often wonder who handles the subtitles. And yeah, I've often wondered about the um, the weight that's on their shoulders because they are uh, yeah, reinterpreting the art. Well, so, are they qualified? Are they, yeah. you know, shouldn't they have a discussion with the director maybe and the, the screenwriter? So it's already, a, it's already apparent that the subtitles were not properly vetted. Well, yeah, per- so, perhaps. Yeah, perhaps that might be the solution. Perhaps Netflix might look into that in that we should get more Korean speakers. Yeah, you know, for example, in this case, we should go over the subtitles with um, you know, a, a subset of Korean speakers and see whether they agree that the, although you can't do the literal translation, is this close enough? Are you happy with it? Is it, you know, it seems like such dangerous waters are treading. You could potentially be very, very offensive and, you know, even change the uh, audience's perceptions of certain characters because of the bad subtitling. So... Be interested to see where they go with this from this point. Okie dokie. Well, that's the end of film news this week. Uh, Liam's got a couple of film reviews for you. I'll let you start where you land, my friend. Okay, so first up, after, well, several years now, I think, of anticipation, I have finally gotten around to the new release, The Many Saints of Newark. Now, mm. me and you... Um, we I know that we've probably banged on about this several times, many times in the podcast, but you and I, as I imagine quite a few people listening, are very, very big fans of The Sopranos. Absolutely, yeah. One of my favourite shows of all time. I think the show is essentially flawless. Absolutely love pretty much every damn thing about it. I would agree with you up until season six. Season six wasn't bad, but I thought it dropped off a little bit in quality. But otherwise, those first five seasons, I still—I know it's a bit of a cliche, especially to come from a TV critic, but I still reckon it's probably the best TV series ever made. Yeah, one hundred percent. I know I've watched it. Um, I've, I've watched it at least a couple of times all the way through, and just enormously enjoyed it. Um, with the subsequent viewing, just as much, just as much as I did the first one. Around. It is a fabulous show. It is a game changer. Just absolute genius on the part of David Chase, the creator. And I think it was, it's, it's definitely a few years ago now. I can't remember exactly when, but I think it was sometime in the 2010s when it was announced that a spin off film would be occurring entitled The Many Sakes of Newark. And I think it was announced around about the time of that initial announcement that it would be a prequel as opposed to some kind of sequel or some kind of co- other contemporaneous spin off. And um, with further development, it was announced that it would focus on a young Tony Soprano and his tutelage underneath Dickie Moltisanti, who is obviously the unseen character in the series, who is also the father of Chrissy Moltisanti, Tony's quote-unquote nephew. And, yep, they finally got around to it. So Dickie Moltisanti, we're in 1967, by the way, in Jersey, and Dickie Moltisanti is played by Alessandro Nivola, 
who is a good actor that I have a lot of time for. And in the opening shot, we see a young Tony, about, he's only about like nine or ten, maybe even a little bit younger. And um, he is with his Uncle Dickie walking through. Um, the, it's, it's, it's weird because it looks very much like a train station terminal. Then um, the people that are going to meet are getting off a plane. So just bizarre there. So an airport then. <laughs> well, yeah, but it doesn't look like an airport at all. They have those in Jersey, maybe. I don't yeah, know. yeah, yeah, maybe. Let's yeah, go with that. Like, yeah, the, we the, don't know anything about Jersey. Our, our airport interiors look more like train stations. What are you, <laughs> you going to fucking do about it? And um, and right off the bat, the start of many, many callbacks to the show. Dickie is with young Tony. Tony obviously looks up to his uncle Dickie and loves him very much. And Dickie calls him Gagoots, which is obviously how Tony uh, referred to AJ in the show. And uh, they are going to meet Dickie's dad, uh, Hollywood Dick Moltisanti, played by Ray Liotta. Oh, wow. Hollywood Dick has just arrived in the US with his wife, uh, Jessipina, played by uh, Michaela de Rossi, who is uh, from the other side. And uh, yes, they become wedding lawful matrimony, and he's brought her back to the States to be his nice, loving, compliant Italian, old fashioned trad wife. It's immediately established that Hollywood Dick, Dick's dad, is he is a fucking, it's an appropriate name. He is a massive dickhead. He's one of those very, very brash, vulgar, old school, loves the sound of his own voice, very insensitive and just rather unpleasant mobsters uh, who is uh, not very kind to Jessapina. And, um, but it, and that does not seem to have rubbed off too much on Dicky Moltisanti because it's early. It's established early on, especially the way Alessandro and Vada plays him. Is that even though this guy's a mobster, he does have some modicum of charisma, and he does try his best to sort of more or less exercise a golden rule kind of thing with people who don't fuck with him. You know, it's like yeah, he's a tough guy. You don't want to get on his wrong side, but he won't just be an absolute piece of shit to you for no particular reason at all. If, you know, for a gangster, he's relatively chill. And he just, you know, when stuff needs to get done, it gets done. Well, Dicky, um, one of Dicky's underlings, a guy who runs a lot of errands for him, is a Harold McBrayer, played by Leslie Odom Jr., who uh, not so long ago I talked about One Night in Miami, and Leslie Odom Jr. played Sam Cooke. All the four leads in that film were absolutely fabulous. And Odom Jr., he is a good actor. But uh, here he's Harold McBrayer, who is... Um, He's a local black dude and uh, very sort of active within the black community. And remember, this is in 1967, which is, you know, it's at the height of, there's a lot of tension and anger around the civil rights movements. You know, it's a, a couple of years after Malcolm X would have been assassinated. It's a year before Martin Luther King um, had his, was slain. Um, so there's a lot of uh, racial tension brewing around and Harold is kind of torn between kind of wanting to sort of earn a decent keep by working for Dickie and feeling the pull of his brothers and sisters, as it were, um, you know, feeling a sort of sense of disloyalty to them because he's doing favours. He's basically an errand boy for the Italian-Americans. And while all of this is going on with Dickie, to the side, we see the focal Soprano family. So you have the kids, Tony and Janice, and then there's Johnny Boy and Livia and Junior and they're just essentially all milling around at the side. But most of the uh, the screen time occupied by Tony and his parents, uh, it's essentially, it consists of um, visual callbacks to things that were only discussed on the show. You see a lot of that become visualized, you know, conversations that Tony in the show has with Melfi or with uh, his sister or with any other characters about, oh, I remember this one time when I was a kid, or my mum and dad did that, or this happened to me. Well, um, the Many Saints of Newark actualizes many of those on the screen. So it slowly but surely, it becomes this sort of uh, dual narrative of Dickie trying to make his way through the underworld of New Jersey whilst dealing with um, in escalating tensions with Harold, who ultimately wants to become the runner of the first black numbers game in the state and trying to keep his head above board with his other mafia-related activities, you know, struggling with his dad, who is a very not-nice man, and, you know, other rivalries. And the way that Tony very much looks up to Uncle Dickie and wants to emulate him, as well as struggling with his own familial dysfunction, because uh, Livia here, played by Vera Farmiga, is, I mean, Livia was one of the, is a fan favourite, but also a notorious character, just for how toxic of a personality she was, 
and she's absolutely no different here whatsoever. She's an utterly repellent and insufferable woman. Johnny Boy, as he was in the show, is quite a temperamental guy. He doesn't suffer falls gladly. Can be quite explosive. And so it's essentially juggling all of that. So, and the tagline is, who made Tony Soprano? So it's Tony, it's an examination of Dickie as a character combined with Tony's adulation of Dickie and the impact that it has on his life as well as Tony's own interior domestic life and just how that all melds. Okay, so it's yeah. pretty simple enough. Okay, well, I was excited for this movie for a couple of years. And, well, right off the bat, what can we say about it? It fucking sucks. <laughs> oh, this God. film was terrible. It was an absolute nightmare to get through. First and foremost, and I know that people might pick me up on this, but, you know, saying, oh, you're just being an impossible to please fan of the show. This is supposed to be a prequel to The Sopranos. This, is, this was essentially something that is, this is riddled with fan service. So this is something that was made for fans. And yet there is so much about See chronological sequence of events and characterization that is completely and utterly fucking whack. You know, for for one thing, Silvio Dante in this this film is depicted as being a balding guy about ten to twenty years older than Tone, hey. even though they were childhood friends of the same age. Um, That's bizarre. Yeah. With, with, how does that even? It filter? doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't work. It doesn't work in any way, shape, or form whatsoever. Junior, Junior, who, as we know, provided a lot of comic relief in the show, but ultimately he was very, very nasty, cantankerous, belligerent, very explosive man, not much unlike his brother, Johnny Boy. And in this, his characterization, you know, his, the, his, the performance by Corey Stoll, which is dreadful, by the way, has Junior as this just very kind of meaningless, perfunctory, essentially uh, like, r just a useless side character who chimes in every now and again, portraying nothing whatsoever of the famed irascibility and sort of uh, hair-trigger temper that, you know... We yeah, he had some very strong character caveats, didn't yeah. he? He was no. quick to anger, very fast wit. Um, yeah, well, there's none of that here. Instead, in this one, Junior is a weird guy who at one point, one point during um, a, w a wake, he tries to start an intellectual conversation, you know, like using words like, oh, this person's name was Gravy Train. I wonder where that sobriquet came from. It's like, do you, Corrado Soprano never says things like that. No. And the extent of um, fans of his with him, occasionally, Corey Stahl, like, aside from acting nothing, even remotely recognisable in any way, shape or form to Dominic Chianese's performance of Junior, is a case, he, 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 a couple of times in the film, he falls down and says, sister's cunt. It's like, oh, yes, 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 very good. This, oh, the narrative is, the narrative is everywhere. This film tries to blend Tony's adolescence and his fascination with his uncle Dickie with um, the kind of social upheavals that would have been occurring during the late 1960s with a lot of racial divide. Which sounds like a good so, idea on paper. I, yeah. wasn't, I wasn't expecting it to go down the civil rights angle. The, the, well, it doesn't really, but it does, it, it, it shines something of a light on that simmering, the simmering racial barriers. This film can't juggle narrative for shit. It never even gets going on exactly what it wants to be. Does it want to be an examination of the racial tensions between black Americans and Italian Americans in New Jersey? Does it want to be an organized crime? Does it want to be a coming of age? Does it want to, does it want to be a cocktail of those? Because whatever it actually wants to be, it never makes it clear at any point. And save for Alessandro Nivola, who actually does something of a decent job, you know, in terms of his performance, he's not, he's not bad. All the other uh, performances in this man, they're, they're fucking shocking. And I don't want to be disrespectful. I didn't want to have to say it. Michael Gandolfini, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't really say, I think I can say off the back of this that he's a bad actor. It's just that the material he was given to work with is just complete and utter drivel. He's just, if he does have any like, real meaty acting skills, they're, they're not giving any room to breathe here whatsoever. It's just an absolute mess. The, the, the characterizations ultimately in the final analysis, they, they're on the same sort of tier as an SNL skit. And the S S Saturday Night Live has done several Soprano parody skits before. And there's 
uh, the overwhelming majority of the characters in this film, the way that they are portrayed, they would not be out of place in one of those. It's boring. It doesn't make any coherent points. Yes, it visually replicates some of the things that were only discussed in The Sopranos, but watching it as a fan, you don't get a sort of, you don't get a great big, uh, mem- you know, chuckle of memory. You don't get uh, a lump in your throat. This is not, a, it's not a motive. It's not poignant. It's not funny because you recall how impactful that moment was when it was in the series. It's just very, very rote, almost like cynically placed. Like, oh, well, the fans will dig this. Just in this absolute gloopy horrible, turgid, stale mess of a film that um, it doesn't reflect the tone of the show at all, doesn't reflect the spirit of the show. This this movie fucking sucks, man. It really sucks. Loads of Sopranos fans have said, is it worth seeing even just a little bit? No. No, it really isn't. It's dreadful. Doing that thing of treading on the show's legacy, I suppose, at that point, right? Yeah. It's, it's just, ugh, nah. It's really, the soundtrack is decent. There's a few times where, you know, what's that song by the Stones? Sway or sticky fingers. That's a really yep. good, yeah. That happens uh, d- during one sort of pivotal scene. There's, there's a really um, good few tunes in the film. That's about his one saving grace. Honestly, everything else, uh, it was it was a trial. It was a fucking trial. And take my advice and avoid it. Uh, fair enough. Yeah, I, I have to say, I'm not entirely surprised with that one. Nah. As soon as the trailer came out, I mean, it just didn't have it didn't have the feel that I was expecting it, and Sopranos fans were expecting it to have. It did. Immediately, it made everyone suck their teeth a little. Even bit though the trailer thing. didn't look, the trailer didn't look good, but the trailer made the film look better than it is. Oh wow! Yeah, avoid, avoid, avoid. Then yes, indeed. And next up, going down a bit of a weird route here, you know how I've mentioned a few times in the past, the recent past, about how I've done a bit of digging around Netflix and essentially selected a random title, not entirely random, some usually something that's come out this year. And uh, just thought, oh, okay, I'll give that a spin. Well, the previous week, I decided to do the exact same thing, but this time with Prime. And I was looking through some titles, and this title jumped out at me. A title and a poster jumped out at me, and it was something that stopped me on tracks. And I went, what the fuck is that? So I looked it up, and for some reason or another, I just thought, I fancy giving this a spin, see where it goes. And this is called <laughs> Introspectum Motel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely had to look this one up when <clears throat> yeah. you said to me you were doing it earlier. I was yeah. like, what the hell is that? Yeah, well, br- brand new release, brand new 2021 release. It's it's available with your Prime subscription, folks, if you have one out there. So yeah, brand new Prime release. And just to, you know, kind of uh, do uh, do my fair, my fair share and not just focus on the great big attention-grabbing releases, you need to give a shout out now and again to the little guy, see how they do. Of course, yeah, yeah. So, Introspective Motel. So this is... Um, Directed by Marcel Dorian, who also co-wrote the screenplay with a couple of other people. And he's also the lead actor in it. Marcel Dorian plays Felipe. Now, Felipe is a uh, quite a successful businessman, well-to-do guy, living in the UK. I believe, from, I mean, from the name and his accent, I'm pretty sure he's, he's either French or Franco-Spanish, something like that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, Felipe, yeah, Felipe is shown to be as I said, you know, well-to-do and rather aggressive and headstrong suit type. Uh, he lives in the burbs with his wife and daughter, his wife, Suzanne, and their daughter, Chloe. And uh, it's around Christmas time. And um, they seem to live like quite a nice, a nice little existence, nice, cozy little, you know, nuclear family where he goes out and gets the bread and he takes care of, wife and daughter and everything's kind of nice and old fashioned. And, you know, if, if he need if he needs to break balls at work, he will do it. You know, anything for his girls, anything to have all, all the luxury and accoutrements they need, et cetera, et cetera. So one weekend, Felipe tells Susan that uh, there's a very, very important work related conference. He needs to go away for the weekend. But the thing is, Felipe isn't going away to a work related conference. He is going away to a motel. Now, this motel is something akin to a slightly more upmarket travel lodge. Somewhere out, more in the kind of sticky areas. 
for those not in the know, Travel Lodge is about as budget as it gets for a oh, UK fuck hotel. Oh, fuck yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, this is a I've stayed in far too many of them. This is a slightly more upmarket and spacious variant of your Travel Lodge. You know, you've got the kind of uh, non committally and fakely chirpy young woman behind the desk. And, <laughs> you know, it's like Chris, it's Christmas, it's around Christmas time, and oh, it's like, oh, my colleagues went out for some after work drinks, but I'm stuck here till such and such and blah, blah, blah. And uh, Philippe, you know, uh, he try he's, he establishes himself as something of a horny dog from the outset because he tries to flirt with her. But she's like, "Oh, you're not my type." He's like, "Well, what, what type? It, what type is that?" She's like, "You know, the older married type." He's like, "Oh, okay. Well, you know, like nothing ventured, nothing gained." And he's sort of like going around, you know, just mooching about, copiously smoking. Um, he r- rings room service so many goddamn times in this film. Um, and or he make he like incessantly make wants to make sure that there's two two glasses of champagne, not a bottle, two glasses of champagne at his room at exactly nine o'clock, and he's sort of milling around, and he's uh, he bumps into a, another guy staying there, a guy named Paul, who's a bit of a, a strange bloke, uh, but seems to kind of be inoffensive enough. He meets uh, Felipe when they're out or sort of on the decking overlooking the nice kind of autumnal lake there. Ask Paul for a lighter. They have a smoke break. They introduce themselves. And Felipe's like, okay, see you later. And soon enough, it transpires that Felipe is there to meet Gabriella, who is his squeeze. He has been cheating on Susan for ages and ages, and they have been coming to this little motel for a rendezvous, and Felipe is quite well known there. He's been using it for tourists for ages and ages. And um, there, there's a lot of uh, fucking in this film, by the way. Some quite, you know, gra- I mean, it's not hard. You don't see penetration, but there's a lot of hardcore banging going on. The, okay. film, the film opens with Felipe banging his wife. Plus one after, point. Yeah, after, <laughs> after he hangs up Christmas de- decorations and then he, they, you know, he does, gives her a good hard doggy in the room. And then when he meets Gabriella, they go right at it. You know, she knocks on his, she plays knock down ginger on him first and he goes out to look outside and he comes in and she's sitting in the chair and she's just like, oh, do you like my surprise? And then they get right down to hardcore banging. Okay. And then um, they have a little bit of a discussion about how it's only supposed to be no strings, but he thinks he might be developing, you know, feelings for her that uh, transcend that little bit. And they have a sort of little bit, a playful back and forth, you know, not really an argument, but sort of like, you know, let's just leave it as it is. Let's not spoil the fun. And then there's another knock at the door. Um, but, but by the way, whenever Felipe orders anything from room service, the voice on the other end is literally a bloke just going, very good, sir. Very good, <laughs> sir. <laughs> That's a high class yes. motel. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Jeeves is right. Yeah, there's another there's another knock at the door and Felipe goes, I don't remember ordering another thing from room service. And he goes up and he opens the door and there is the chap, Paul, who he had a smoke break with earlier, and he tases Felipe unconscious. Um, now, to reveal anything else, would just uh, be getting massively in spoiler territory because you might be thinking right now, Jesus Christ, Liam's probably not going to, he's probably going to say to people to stay the absolute hell away from this film, but that's not necessarily true. This film is hilarious. Honestly, I watched this Sunday night just gone, and it is just one of the most sort of weird, simultaneously, it's ambitious and yet very formulaic. And it has the most bizarre and unexpected logical holes in it that consequently turn into gaping plot holes where the motives of each and every character just become more and more opaque and blithering and just downright creepily random and untangible with the progression of the narrative. So, so, so essentially, the movie is something of a treatise on infidelity because, yes, Felipe's been playing away. He's been betraying his wife by meeting up with Camille, who's played by uh, G- Gabriella Brenda. And um, unbeknownst to him, this poor chap who's been hanging around, who has introduced himself as a teacher, and who is also staying at the um, motel seemingly by himself. He is attached to Felipe in um, you know this way that's fairly easy to predict. But essentially, the film goes into uh, sort of goes in for a treatise about the examination of the psychology of fidelity and the ramifications of it, and then it just becomes this 
utterly bizarre, idiosyncratic, softcore porn film where you can tell this this movie was just made for, well, anyone of either sex who seems to just gets really gets their rocks off from stuff like sharing and voyeurism. You know? Okay. Um, Marcel Dorian is a fucking terrible actor. It, uh, I could not stop laughing. Him, him as Felipe, he is one of the worst actors I've ever seen. And, I mean, when he is in moments of peril, he delivers some lines halfway convincingly. But other than that, he is this really, really, in the best way possible, risible sort of conveyor of um, <laughs> of emotion. Paul, played by Joseph Steen, he is this, he, he, as I said before, he's a teacher. And about 95% of his dialogue just consists of this really kind of esoteric, philosophical rambling. And I I really picked up early on about how this movie, it treads the line between trying to portray him as a pretentious bastard, but also insulting its audience's intelligence. Because there's a point where Paul says to another character, like, the golden rule is it's an old time philosophy and it's basically the cornerstone of reciprocal altruism. He's like, oh, I'm sorry, are those two big words going over your head? And I'm thinking that's simultaneously intended to portray him as an arrogant prick. But also the screenwriters were thinking, like, the people who watch this kind of shit won't know what this yeah, means. The audience so, won't yeah, get it. No, so, no. They're all thick. <laughs> this, is, is, this, is this a good film? No, it's not really. But is this a really, really sleazy, baffling, just utterly out there film where the more it reveals about what its characters have done and why they are doing what you see on the screen, you just sit there going, this doesn't make any fucking sense. I just can't work this out anymore. It's just loads and loads of titties and bouncing up and down and people just waffling on in all this turgid, esoteric wannabe philosophizing. And at one point, there's a guy sitting tied to a chair with a reef around his head. And you're thinking, what the fuck is all of this going on for? This shit is absolutely mental. I just, I couldn't stop laughing. I actually had a really good time with this film. It's a stupid load of bollocks. It's, it was just made for, you know, your trashy paperback lovers. But there's just something about the way it's shot, the way it's acted, the way the script goes. I was really entertained by it. It was just weird and funny and really shitty. And yeah, I had a great time. <laughs> so yeah, so if, if you, if you want to have an ironic good time, like honestly, stick it on because it's funny. Okay then, well, TV of the week. And this week, I've got a Danish thriller. A Danish thriller? Yes. A Nordic noir? Uh, sort of, yes. Sort of. Uh, we'll, we'll get into genre classifications and things in a bit. I mean, it is essentially a police procedural Danish thriller. And it's called The Chestnut Man. Oh, I've heard of this. Yeah, yeah. it has been getting a little bit of traction, actually, which is kind of cool. Um, it's also based on a, a novel of the same name by Soren Svestrup. And he's the same writer who did The Killing. Yeah. Which uh, was a huge Danish hit quite a few years ago now. And this is the latest adaptation of his work. It's brand new, came out on the 29th of September this year and is available on Netflix. So this opens in the late 80s on, I believe it's a a small island of Denmark. It's a, a, a small area called Mon. And we see a police officer on his way through these like rural farmland, kind of you know, fields and pastoral scenes around him. And he's eating his lunch greedily off the car seat next to him as he's driving through these fields. And he gets a call over his radio that a local farmer, his cows have become loose. And so he knows the farm, he knows the local area. He drives there to inform this farmer that his livestock are now rampaging around the lands and eating other people's crops. And as he gets there, he notices that the place is mysteriously quiet. And there is a pig outside, dead, shot dead. And so he immediately suspects something's up. He pulls his gun. He goes into the house and finds everything completely quiet and still. And as he's looking round, he makes his way into the kitchen and finds a woman slumped, shot dead across the kitchen table. So now he's really starting to freak out. He picks up the phone and he calls for backup and says, you need to send everything you have down here. Ambulances, police, the whole lot. Something really, something bad has gone down at this farmstead. He's creeping around a bit more and he finds uh, another dead body slumped up against the wall. And he hears a mysterious clattering coming from downstairs in the basement. So he tentatively makes his way downstairs and he finds this kind of padded room. And 
on the wall are these shelves. And on the shelves are these chestnut men. Now, apparently this is a thing in Denmark around about Halloween. Uh, it's a common thing that uh, children do is they get chestnuts and rather than play conkers with them as we would in this country, that you take matchsticks and you snap the match heads off and you make essentially what looks like a small snowman with the chestnuts. Mm. So you've got a big one for the body, a little one for the head. You put them together like stick figures, essentially. He sees along these shelves on the side of the room are all these chestnut men. And he's looking around tentatively with his flashlight until he hears a whimpering from underneath a nearby table. He looks under the table and sees a little girl with her knees pulled up to her chest, uh, quivering, terrified in the corner. And he puts his gun down. He says, hey, hey, it's okay. I'm police. You know, where is everybody? What's going on? Everything's going to be fine. The little girl looks behind him. There's a cutaway to the chestnut men. And suddenly a splash of blood flies across the screen. And we get the opening credits. The opening credits, by the way, have the most ominous theme music you've ever heard in your life. You yeah. Know, you know, like the um, Inception, bwang, like that horn blast thing. Yeah. Imagine that, but in a lower, you know, spooky thriller kind of key. It's a really like a, a rumbling kind of effect that lets you know, you know, the sort of dark shit you're going to be in Indeed. with for this show. So we cut to the modern day and we meet Naya, played by Danica Kirkik. And I love my pronunciation on that, by the way. I'm pretty sure that's right. It felt good. It felt really good. <laughs> <laughs> Naya is, uh, well, we first see her um, having sex with her on again, off again. I'm not going to say boyfriend, but sort of partner that she has at the time. Keeping no strings is better that way. Yeah, it's, 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 made, <laughs> it's made clear fairly early on that this is more of an arrangement than a relationship kind of thing. But anyway, she finishes doing that and she gets her little daughter ready for school. And her daughter is doing a project at school for uh, family trees. She's made this family tree, but she's disappointed in hers because hers is quite small. But her mother's reassuring her that, no, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. Drops her off at school and goes to work. Now, wouldn't you believe it, given that I've said that this is a police procedural? She's a detective. And she turns up at her work and she speaks to her boss. And her boss isn't very happy with her because she wants to be transferred from her role as detective to doing a more, I believe it's more sort of intelligence-based, um, computer-based work. I think it's called N93 or something like that, that she wants to move to a, a secretive department and he's a bit unhappy with it because she's a damn good detective. But anyway, she's being given a new partner for the day. Mark Hess, played by Mikkel Abo Folsgaard. And she's not very happy with this arrangement because she's heard of this guy before. He used to work for Europol, which is a bit like Interpol, but for Europe. So he's sort of a special agent moving around between countries kind of thing. Um, but he's been fired from his last few jobs. He's got a bit of a reputation for being difficult to work with. And she's been given him as a partner. She's heard that he's a bit of a dick. Yeah, and he's, her boss is quite apologetic as well. Going, you, look, he's not going to be around here for very long. He's going to be sent off to Budapest in the next couple of weeks. Look, just have him tag along with you. You need a partner for the next couple of weeks before you move on to your next job. He can come with you. So they go out on their first call. And it's a call to a small Danish house on the edge of town by the railway tracks. And when they get there, they find that a young boy who lives at the house had got up in the morning, made himself some breakfast, wondered where his mum was, went out to the back garden and found her dead. So Naya and Mark turn up. Uh, Naya's already unhappy with Mark because he wanted to stop for a coffee on the way. And she thought that was very, very unprofessional. <laughs> but they, they turn up at this little house right by the railway tracks they go into the back garden where forensics are already working on the body and they find this woman um, trussed up against like a, the kind of fence that you grow vegetables and spring peas and things <clears> with. She's trussed up there and very curiously, she's missing her hand. It's been cut off by some sort of angle grinder or sharp tooth saw. So the forensic guys are looking over this and even stranger still, sitting next to her on the ground is a tiny little chestnut man and no one knows what it means. While this is going on, we also meet a Rosa Harton, played by Ibn Dorna. Uh, she is a politician. She is the social minister for Denmark. And we find her returning to work after a long absence. And the reason she was absent was because a year previously, her daughter had gone missing. And the police have been unable to find her and have presumed her dead. So after taking a long period of convalescence, she is now getting back in the game. She's going back to the ministerial offices. And it is revealed that the chestnut man that was found next to this handless woman has a fingerprint on it. And the fingerprint on it matches the daughter of Rosa Harton. Mm. Dun, 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 as we like to say yeah. on the podcast. So yes, 
This is a police procedural and it's a European foreign language police procedural. My fucking favourite. <laughs> I mean, I love these things. I've reviewed many of them, uh, particularly like the Valhalla murders. I mean, there's been so many of these released on Netflix over the past couple of years and I always enjoy them. So you have to bear in mind that my review might be a little bit biased because I am a fan of the genre. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But I have to say, I mean, I'm not the only one to be a big fan of police procedurals. They're hugely successful and a lot of them are made for a reason. This is a particularly good one. It's six episodes long, which makes it toit like a tiger. Toit like a tiger. Yeah. It's got that right pacing for a procedural as well, in that it starts off very slowly and mysteriously and gives you a lot of character work and a lot of uh, emotional build up. It's, it sets its scene very, very nicely, but in a way, maybe slightly too slow, which I kind of love when a procedural does that. Because you know if it's going to be a good one and you can tell from the way this is shot and the way that it's acted and yeah, with the writer's credentials and all this kind of stuff that it's likely to be a good one. You know that it's going to ramp and it's going to do that movement where it becomes pacier and pacier. More crimes are committed. There's no spoiler there. Yeah, obviously this is going to be a series of events that leads up to a dramatic conclusion. Everyone knows how these go. You expect that format. But this has got just about everything where you want it to be for one of these, if that sounds like damning with faint praise. <laughs> it's chilling at points, and that's very, very cool. It's got naturalistic acting and great camera work. Again, you expect that to happen. One thing you are waiting for with a good police procedural is a twist. This show's got a really, really good one. I mean, a really so the, good like twist. So the focal mystery is very well written. Yeah, it, it, but it goes down a line that is quite conventional. And I don't mind that. You know, I've, perhaps it's, you know, again, I might be biased. I've seen so many of these and so many of them sort of mirror themselves in terms of, it, it's very, very tropey as a genre. I just happen to like the tropes. It goes down that path as you expect. But the twist, I mean, I'm not going to be one of those people that sits here and brags and goes, I always see twists coming. But I've normally, I'd say I've probably got like a, I don't know, 70, 30 success rate with spotting a twist coming. There's no way you're going to spot this one coming. And I appreciated that a hell of a lot. The, obviously, the uh, perpetrator of these events is the titular chestnut man. The reveal of the chestnut man made me go, oh, wow, okay, there's no way you could have spotted that. And it's nice, subtle cueing along the way that I was picking up on, but I didn't quite put everything together. And there's something about a police procedure where everything has to be obsequious to the extent that it's got to throw you for a loop. It's got to throw you down red herrings and false avenues and you've got to go along with the detectives. And you've got that um, dynamic buddy cop aspect to it as well where you've got the lazy detective, if you like, doesn't want to be there, but he actually starts you know, getting into it and becoming more and more useful. And actually, maybe he's a bit of a savant rather than being a prick. This guy you know? isn't a fat, lazy cunt. Yeah, well, he's very skinny, actually. But, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> and, you know, his gradual reveal of his tragic backstory. Again, no spoilers here because if you've watched police procedurals, you know that's coming. But in this... Everything is just clearly cut and defined and nicely proportioned. There's nothing mind-blowing going on here. It's just a very, very good police procedural with an excellent, excellent twist coming. And does it have the, because uh, I noticed you mentioned uh, that the corpse is discovered trussed up with a hand cut off. Is that sort of the visual extent of the savagery? Because usually you get a lot of like nude corpses with various slashings and... You know, well, one thing I will reveal, because it's, it's revealed to the characters quite, quite early, is that um, Naya makes the connection that when you make chestnut men, you snap the heads off the matches. Right, okay. So we're right. sort of going down that line. Yeah, there's, there's some gore and blood at points, but nothing I think that's um, overly gratuitous or overly done. There's certainly some shocking scenes in this, but it's much more about the chilling mystery and the you're going down the rabbit hole to see if you can f figure out who the chestnut man is, and I guarantee you, you won't. So... What's my summation of this, really? Do you like police procedurals? If you do, watch The Chestnut Man. <laughs> do you not have any time for police procedurals? You won't like The Chestnut Man very much then <laughs> because it's about as police procedural as it gets. But as a fan of the genre, I thought it was really, really well done and definitely worth your time. Well, I really do like police procedurals myself. So, yes. It's a good one. It really, really is. Nice adding to that to the watch bin. And do let me know about your theories on the way through because you know, maybe it's just me, but I, I couldn't see this one coming and I appreciate that. Well, I hope, good I, writing. Don't, I, hope I don't either. Mm. Okay, then. Well, let's finish off the podcast with some trivia. And, well, 
I had a funny feeling. Chestnuts. <laughs> <laughs> I had a funny feeling that, again, I haven't read any reviews because I wait for your ones and I, I don't want to ruin anything, but I had a funny feeling you wouldn't like The Many Saints of Newark just because the backlash has been uh, unavoidable, really. It's, it's warranted. But, I mean, it's a good opportunity to do some trivia on The Mob, isn't it? The Mob. The Mob. Oh, The Mob, yeah. I thought you might have been going down the Sopranos there for a split second. Like Sopranos yeah, together. I thought about it, but we would probably get into spoiler territory. And I, I was originally going to do trivia about the New Jersey Mob to kind of localise it. But actually, doing my research this afternoon, would you believe it? It's actually quite hard to get trivia on The Mob. There definitely still is that sort of omerta kind of thing. Oh, of course. Yeah, you yeah, want yeah, Mob yeah. trivia. Most of it goes back to sort of the 50s and that kind of stuff. Everything else is very, very secretive. But I've, I've put together some uh, Mob facts anyway. Mm. Let's start off with this one. There was a time when mob bosses in the United States were household names, but not anymore. Consider the FBI's review of American brand organized crime on its website. The history of La Cosa Nostra ends with the death of Genovese crime family boss Vincent the Chin Giganti in 2005. Giganti's fame stretched back to the late 1950s when his boss, Vito Genovese, ordered him to hit a rival, the mob prime minister, Frank Costello. Giganti shot only wounded Costello, who nonetheless retired after more than 30 years in the business, allowing Genovese to take over and rename Costello's Luciano family after himself. The Genovese family soon rose to the top, and Vito kept running things even while serving time in a federal prison in Atlanta after his conviction for conspiracy to traffic narcotics in 1960. Giganti took over following Genovese's death in the slammer in 1969. Giganti directed the crime group while faking mental illness, traipsing around in his bathrobe on the streets of New York's Greenwich Village. But convictions for racketeering, murder conspiracy, and obstruction of justice kept Giganti in US custody from 1997 until he died in the very prison hospital where Gambino crime family boss John Gotti passed in 2002. So, who's the boss of anything today? Giganti's demise represented the end of celebrity mob bosses. No one seems to agree who the bosses of the families are anymore, aside from speculation among pundits, and the title of acting boss that federal prosecutors assign ad hoc to family leaders from case to case. Yeah, I know um, it's weird because I know obviously like if you're kind of a follower of uh, mob affairs, which I like, well, organised crime in general I am, but you had uh, Sonny Franzies um, who died not too long ago at the age of 102 and who was a fucking stone gangster, spent 50 years in prison and never flipped, mm. even came close to it. He was like a severely old school. But yeah, I mean, and he was a big noise. But yeah, you're right, apart from him, the mob, yeah, that golden age. I mean, I, I would have said it probably died, it went with Gotti, you know, the real public fascination with um, the mafia or, the, you know, and the limelight shone on at least one focal figure. But yeah, you mentioned Giganti as well, I guess. I remember watching a documentary about uh, mob bosses and had a, a FBI investigator as the, sort of the lead and he investigated a lot of the big families. And he said there's a golden rule with the mob, which is um, if you're not hearing anything about them, they're doing very, very well. Yeah. That's, yeah, ever since Gotti, there's been this thing of staying underground and the less you hear about them, the more active they are. The more you hear about them, the more they're on the decline because everything's become out in the open. So, uh, and yeah. yeah, doing my research this afternoon, everything seems to be very much stum. Well, you know, they're just, I mean, most of it, I mean, any sort of crime organization worth its salt these days, they're just, they're in the cyber crime racket. You know, they're doing lots Apparently of- Apparently a lot you know, of that, yeah. Yeah, I did find some bits about, um, you know, uh, Wall Street banking, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. You don't, you don't need to- Inside of trading. You, you don't need to um, stick up card games anymore. Yeah. You know, or rob armored trucks. It's just very like, you know, it's, it's out of chic. Here's a story that I think is just begging to be made into a good movie. Stephen Caracappa and Louis Epolito were former New York City Police Department detectives who worked on behalf of the five families of the American Mafia, principally the Lucchese and Gambino crime families while they committed various illegal activities. The two became known as the Mafia Cops. In 2006, they were convicted of labor racketeering, extortion, narcotics, illegal gambling, obstruction of justice, eight counts of murder, and conspiracy to commit murder, charges stemming from the 1980s and the early 1990s, and in the 2000s in Las Vegas. Both were convicted in 2006 and sentenced to life imprisonment in 2009. Apolito was also an actor. Really? Yeah, you can find him in various... He plays a cop in Lost Highway, directed by David Lynch. Apolito's shown up in a couple of movies. Is it Apolito, spelled with an E? 
How do you spell it again? E double P O L I T O. Sorry, Epolito, yeah. But, but no, yeah, you can find him. He plays a police officer in Lost Highway and he's shown up in a couple of other, um, shown up in State of Grace, you know, the Irish mob thing. Oh, is he in that as well? Yeah, he's in that too, yeah. But yeah, no, you're right. He was, um, he was also a. Uh, I mean, know, the title's right there in the trivia as well Mafia Cops. I mean, yeah. come on, it's got to be done, right? Scorsese, get on it. Yeah, yeah, fucking get, get right on it, man. Jesus Christ. Going way back here. Al Capone's brother was a prohibition agent. While Capone made his money flouting the nationwide constitutional ban on the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors, another Capone made his money enforcing it. Al's oldest brother, James Vincenzo Capone, left New York in his mid-teens and changed his name to Richard James Hart after silent film Western idol William S. Hart. He eventually became a federal prohibition agent in Nebraska. And it's quite an iconic sort of uh, sibling contrast, isn't it? Because I mean, many... I like to imagine them, you know, having coming together at Christmas and having awkward conversations. Yeah, well, so how's know... business? I'm not telling you. Yeah, <laughs> well, it was a long time after that. Do you know, I think during the seventies, you know, cause obviously you had Whitey Bulger and then uh, Whitey's brother, um, is it Billy? I think uh, he was like a, a congressman. Yeah, senator, yeah. and he got pulled up before. You know, he's just he had to say about a million times. You know, I don't know where my brother is for Christ's sake. You know? <laughs> Frank Sinatra acted as a liaison between the leader of Chicago's mafia and the Kennedy family during the 60s, primarily in order to get union backing. When Kennedy reneged on his promises after being elected, Sinatra was punished by having to play eight straight nights at the crime boss's club. Well, you know. To me, that sounds, that's a really light punishment from a mob boss. Do you know what I mean? Like, most people get their fucking heads cut off. You got to play eight shows at my club. I'm a Sinatra fan, and I think he had a great talent. But he, he just in terms of his, you know, relatively he, his ascension was hastened by mafia backing. Yeah, and he got to the he basically got to the top a lot easier than he would have if he was just you know slumming it because he had some very very powerful people who were just like <laughs> basically like we got a lot invested in this kid. So he's going to become famous, and then this, this, that's the end of the story. Oh, you know, blue eyes, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a, yeah, he's a, you know, I like, I like Frank, but you know, he was a pretty, he's in bed with the mob, quite a ferocious temper. You know? And no one's quite sure as to the depth of his involvement as well, because I mean, he almost exclusively, like his social circle, were all big time gangsters. Well, so what, presumably he was around when a lot of really bad shit went down. Well, one know? one time he was in a club with um, his lady friend, and um, Jackie Gleason was on stage, and he was taking the piss out of Sinatra. Jackie Gleason's act ends, he goes backstage, and a couple of La Cosa Nostra goons walk up to him and just keep the shit out of him and say, watch your fucking mouth. Yeah. So, you know. And you would. <laughs> yeah. You, to be fair. And let me just finish off with this here. Arnold Rothstein, a kingpin of the Jewish mafia who was behind the Black Sox scandal, refused to identify an attempted assassin to the police, saying, you stick to your trade, I'll stick to mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, even, you know, you don't gross up an enemy. That's when you know that somebody is like that. That's a committed fucking monster. My favorite <laughs> character on Boardwalk Empire as well. I thought it was, it was Michael. Um, oh, what's his name? Stuhlbarg. Stuhlbarg. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a magnificent. I always remember. I show. always loved it when uh, Jip Rossetti like points at Rothstein and he's, he's like, you know, you you creep around like a fucking dentist with the ether, yeah. you know, because he does. He has this like really, grinning malevolence. Yeah, he just has thing, this yeah. really creepy spectral, thing almost about vampiric. Him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's very, very, very unnerving. One of my, one of my favorite TV performances in general. Oh hell yeah, yeah. Stuhlberg absolutely nails that. Oh, it nails the fuck out of it. Yeah. But anyway, yes, that's the end of our free podcast this week. Thank you so much for listening. We're going to go and record the premium now. Uh, I've got three docuseries to do. Damn. Well, actually, two docuseries and a, a documentary film, to be entirely accurate. So yes, thought I'd have a roundup of those. Liam, what have you got for this this week? I've got a film, and I've also got a TV show. I watched another TV series, one that came out a little while ago now, but um, I've just like been, I've been sort of, I've steamed a bit of the way through it. And uh, they both have a link in that they're both about the very, very cheery subject of serial murderers. Excellent. Well, so, actually, uh, my documentary film's about serial cool. murderers. Yeah, so we're going to have a nice premium about um, murdering bastards. Yeah, come and listen to two English dickheads talk about nasty people. I mean, why wouldn't you, right? Absolutely. <laughs> A-OK. -okay. 
If any of that does interest you, please do check out cinementalist.com for a link to our Patreon page. You can follow us on Twitter at Cinementalcast. You can follow Liam at... I'm Liam at the movies at Wacko Jacko's Flicks. Oh, and just as a quick note as well, we're going to be switching our hosting provider exclusively over to Anchor. Mm. So I know from our uh, listening figures, etc., that most of you are already listening through Spotify and Anchor-related stuff anyway. Just on the off chance you've got any listeners listening through something like one of the smaller ones, like iHeartRadio or something like that. Um, we're still going to be available on our us- usual places, but it, some of those streams will get cut off in the meantime. So you can find every new episode on our Twitter accounts. You can find them on the Cinementalist webpage and you can find them via Anchor on Spotify, Apple Music, all the big ones, essentially. We're still we're still going to be very easy to find. Yes, absolutely. We're just sort of going for the, the main ones rather than you know, turning off some of the smaller streams. So we're still out there. We're still massively available. You'll find us on all the big providers. And of course, the free podcast is always free. So there you go. Indeed. Okie dokie, guys. Thank you so much for that. Uh, We will be back next week with another free one and another premium one. Please come and join us for the premium episodes. If not, see you next week.